Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Fernando A. Flores in support of Valley-esque and in conversation this evening with author Matt Bell. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep the chat window open as I'll be sharing links to purchase tonight's book uh, from Literati Bookstore throughout the event. And the Q&A is available to you to use at any time. I encourage you to, uh, whenever the spirit moves you, please submit your questions using the Q&A and I'll read a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. Live transcription is also available to you on your toolbar as well using the CC icon. And if you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You'll also find a little typewriter button in the bottom of the video here on my right, where you can uh, click to subscribe to our channel and be kept up to date with all of our at home with Literati events once they become available there. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan um, or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, though, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon or, or much later this evening, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Fernando A. Flores was born in Mexico and grew up in South Texas. He is the author of the collection Death to the Bullshit Artists of South Texas and the novel Tears of the Truffle Pig, which was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and named the best book of 2019 by Tor.com. His fiction has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, Quarterly, American Short Fiction, Plowshares, Frieza, Porterhouse Review, and elsewhere. He lives in Austin, Texas. And joining him in conversation, Matt Bell is the author most recently of the novel Appleseed, a New York Times notable book, and his craft book, Refuse to Be Done, a guide to novel writing, rewriting, and revision, released this year. He's also the author of the novels Scrapper and In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, as well as the short story collection, A Tree or a Person or a Wall, a nonfiction book about the classic video game Baldur's Gate 2, and several other titles. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Esquire, Tin House, Un the Un Orion, excuse me, and many other publications. A native of Michigan, he teaches creative writing at Arizona State University. Please join me in welcoming Fernando A. Flores and Matt Bell into your living rooms. Thanks so much, uh, John, for introducing us. Thanks to Literati for having us. Uh, Literati is one of my favorite bookstores. I've always uh, lived in Ann Arbor for a long time, and I'm always really happy to be back there, uh, even virtually. Um, hi, Fernando. How are you? Hello, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, John and Literati. I've never been to Literati, but I've always wanted to. I, You know, it looks beautiful. I follow them on Instagram, and they look right. <laughs> so beautiful all the time, especially in, like, in the winter when it's snowing out there. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I want to be there right now. Yeah, down here in the Southwest, I feel the same way. You sort of always see their winter pictures. And, I, you know, I know those sort of snowy streets of Ann Arbor. Um, oh, but I just want to say, you know, I, uh, I'm i really glad to get to talk to you about Valley-esque. I feel like I should probably show it so people can see it on the, on the Zoom. Um, I'm such a huge fan of your, your fiction, uh, which I came to through your novel, Tears of the Truffle Pig, a book that I, I love and I've read and reread and I'm constantly suggesting to people. And I'm so glad to have this new collection of stories to continue my fandom with. Um, for those of you in the audience who haven't read Fernando before, I really think there's no one who writes exactly like him. I'm um, such a pleasure always to be in contact with his voice on the page, which I think it was a, a border crossing, genre fluid, style hopping, fantastical, surreal, satirical voice um, that I, I really love and, and I'm always sort of um, thrilled to be in touch with. Um, Fernando, I wondered if we could start today talking about like kind of a big picture view of the genesis of Valley-esque uh, when did you write the first story in the collection? Um, how did your conception of what you wanted your short stories to do change over the time you were writing this book? Yes, thank you so much for all those wonderfully kind words, Matt. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you for being here tonight. And for everybody who's watching us out there, thank you for making the time to join us. Uh, you know, Valley S, the first story in there is the oldest one is came out was I wrote like in 2010. It's the call it's the starkest, most realist story in the collection. Mm -hmm. It's called the 29th of April. 
And it was written during a time when like, it was, uh, most of my family still lives in Reynosa across the border from Mexico, from uh, South Texas, from McAllen, when my, my father still lives in, in McAllen. But uh, around that time, like the border violence and all these borders they were really, really escalating. And I was really consuming a lot of media and Mexican media about it, you know. Uh, it's weird talking about that time because a lot of people even who talked about it a lot during that time kind of like downplay it or pretend like mm. or are sick of it or sick of everybody's sick of it. everybody's sick of all this narco stuff and stuff like that you know but at the time it was it really really weighed on me and also I had just gotten I had just acquired a mechanical typewriter and I had an electrical typewriter for a long time. Mm. And that one, you can know, and with electric typewriters, I don't know if anybody uh, remembers or I don't know if you sure, yeah. remember using one, but, you know, after like eight or 10,000 words, the ink cartridge is over, you know, so I'd be, I'd be so afraid to write a short story, you know, and be like in the heat of the moment there and then just run out of ink, which would happen a lot. And then right. I just, and then I'd open the hood of the machine, I'd grab the ink cartridge and I'd throw it across <laughs> the top. I'd be so pissed off. But eventually when I acquired my mechanical sniper, that went away, you know, I got an ink ribbon and in the 12 years that I've had it, I changed the ink ribbon once, you know, and I've written three books on it. So <laughs> that fear went away. So, so all these, all these things, all these things were happening in the border at the time. And I, and I, all of a sudden I hear, I heard this, like, I, I felt in contact with this voice and I just sat down and I wrote that story like in, like in two or three sittings. And I just left it there. It was a really stark story. And I never read, written anything like it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the story that I almost didn't put in there. You know, I almost didn't, I almost didn't put it in there because it was the starkest story, the most realist story in the collection. But without it, the book felt out of balance, too, mm -hmm. you know. Because I have some there's some stories in there that are very, very like surrealist to like the in the polarity of realism, realism and surrealism. I have one that is really, really surrealist. So I thought, you know, it would be good to balance out the collection with, a, and on the other end, with a really, really stark and realist story. And then in the middle, and then throughout have stories that are in the middle of those two polarities, you know? So I, I very much kept this in mind. So like six of these stories were written between 2010 uh, and like 2018. And like the other half of the stories were written between 2018 and 2020. Oh. Okay. So I wrote six stories really, really fast. Six or seven stories kind of fast. And the other seven, I kind of plucked them from this decade. And I, there was like three or four of them that just didn't make the cut. It just didn't seem natural to have them in there. So I really thought about it for a long time, you know, when I really wrestled with a title for a long time, I didn't know what to call the mm -hmm. collection for a long time, you know. So, and I really wanted it to be like a statement or something. I knew it was going to be my last book that takes place on the border in South mm. Texas. So I wanted to have like a trilogy, a trilogy to end it, you know. I lived in the border for 18 years, so from the time I was five years old to the time I was 23. And next year will be my 18th year in Austin, Texas. I moved mm. to Austin. So I've, 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 been as long, I've been away from it for that long. So three books, that's about as much as I got in me. <laughs> you know? It's someone else's turn now. It's someone else's turn to do it. So I was very, very conscious of this. So I'm like, I'm going to go out with a bang, you know, and just try to do the most, you know, the craziest things that I can do, but also like try to harness the craziness with some of the stories. I don't know. I, I meandered a lot with that. Question. No, no, it's good. I mean, the, the the whole trick of this is that I give you prompts to meander around on. So like, that seems great. Um, I, uh, it had never occurred to me, I only used typewriters a little bit in high school, I had like keyboard in class and typewriters. And I, mm -hmm. I bought a typewriter occasionally out of like the romance of it as like a young writer, but I've just mm -hmm. grown up with computers and so I've always used that. It had never occurred to me of the fear of like not being able to type more words. Yeah. That's a mechanical thing, which is like such an interesting, like, what if I'm in the middle of a run? I mean, I guess a laptop battery dies or something, but it doesn't <laughs> feel the same way. Like uh, even having to go get an ink ribbon in like our time would be like, it's an enormous task as opposed yeah. to like plugging something yeah. in. Um, I love that as a, a constraint maybe, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm all about that, like constraints, you know, like in... Uh... In my in the approach to the craft of 
of the creation of aspect of it. You know, another part of like writing on a typewriter is that, you know, I have to see my mistakes on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to see my failures on the page, you know, and uh, and I just don't have that if I'm doing it in the computer. I don't feel that I'm learning. I, I, I need to be able to see where I'm messing up, you know? So so that that's, that's an important aspect of that aspect for me uh, as, as a writer, you know? So I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, and it feels just maybe like generally healthy to be like doing something with your body at the same time and doing with your mind, which the device yeah, yeah. never feels like, right? I mean, the computer yeah. just does not. Often. You know, when it's violent, you know, yeah. you, hear, you hear the loud sounds of it. Yeah. But also, like, everybody knows when you're not writing, you know. <laughs> the thing, like, you're accountable to people. You're like, yeah. oh, I haven't, I haven't heard the keys in a while. Right. What's going on? You know? Oh, you're right. I'm never getting one of those mechanical keyboards. I'll stay in here with my whisper, quiet little Apple <laughs> keyboard and, and pretend I'm working all day. Um, <laughs> so you wrote these six stories, the second six stories. That must have been after Truffle Pig. Yes. You yes. have, like, six that are before and six after um did writing truffle pig change your conception of the short story in some way like i think for me i've kind of broken my short story brain i write one every couple of years and i feel like like my novelist brain is somehow like in the way of my short story brain but you wrote half and half and i'd just be curious like what the post is there something different about the post novel stories with truffle yeah. pig you first you know for me it was just a matter it took me a long time as a writer to for the you know i don't want to say find my voice or like but to say like to find what what was interesting to me about writing in my own writing you know uh and it took writing truffle pig to discover that you know and i crept at it with several stories here like with the story called nocturne from a world concave which is a story that has like Frederic Chopin, the pianist, as mm -hmm. uh, living in Ciudad Juarez, you know. And obviously, he never lived in Ciudad Juarez or whatever. But writing something like that, that was like kind of crazy, kind of gave me the courage to write something like Tears of the Truffle Pig, you know. So the stories that I wrote like before that, that are here, I was kind of me creeping towards this is this. I know the word aesthetic gets used a lot, but like the word yeah. this aesthetic, this this you know this playground, I guess that was that is I guess work your work your your you know your stories you know yeah. so so yeah a lot of, so after truffle pig you know I kind of I kind of had an, had more of an idea I you know I I wrote that in three months and I'm like, okay, every short story that I did afterwards, I wrote it really, really fast. I, mm -hmm. I drafted it really, really fast uh, on a typewriter. I, you know, I'd go into, for lack of a better phrase or way to say it, I went to like boot camp with like each story and I type, I write the, I, the whole thing. I draft the whole thing out in the, on the typewriter in like three days, each story. And, and then I put it into the computer and I print it out and I'd edit it and I'd put it and I'd do the same thing over and over like five times. Yeah. I do, I do it five times for every story and then I'll be done. And I'm like, okay, yeah. I'm not looking to look at this until later. Yeah. So I did that for every story. I did that for every story. I did it. I revised it five times and all this in the span of a week, like a week or 10 days. Mm -hmm. I never spent more than like two weeks on every story. And then afterwards, when I had it as a manuscript, I worked harder on it as a, as a, as a whole thing. So every every step on the way, I just, I work really, really hard in a different stage, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was thinking about um, like the Chopin story, for instance, and um, and there's something a little, uh, reminds you a little of like Borges, partly just in its like confidence. You just like present these, like the Lee Harvey Oswald stories is similar, like you just present these, like this happened, even though it's made up uh, with these historical figures and these real places. And I wonder how much like your speed of, of composition is related to that confidence, right? Like you don't, if you write it in five days, you don't have time for your brain to be like, well, how does this work? What does this yeah. mean? You sort of like you're short circuiting your, your um, uh, analytic part of your own brain. Yeah, yeah. You know, and a lot of it, I think that, that transfers to like the writing part of it because whenever I'm writing a story, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm writing a story and I realize that I'm writing, and I become conscious of the act of writing, I stop writing mm. because I'm like, oh, I'm too conscious of what I'm doing. Um, if, I, if, I, if I 
find myself like breaking out of the act of creation and thinking all of a sudden I become like an editor in the middle of it or I start where I become aware that I'm writing I just stop I'm like okay I can continue doing this another time yeah and that's how I did every one of the stories you know every one of the stories as soon as I become conscious of the writing aspect of it I just withdraw myself and that's how I wrote Truffle Pig too and that's what I learned about writing Truffle Pig that that I don't have to I don't have to force myself to write because right. at any given moment even if you step away even if you become conscious of writing and you're like or you step away for a moment you go wash like a dish or something and you, you can come back and you, you back get back into it you know it's like uh you when you're skateboarding you fall off and you get back on yeah you know? okay. So it was interesting. It was interesting for me to do that as far as a short story collection, you know, because I wasn't thinking that my next book was going to be a short story collection. You know, I really wasn't. No one ever is, you know. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> but people ask me, like, uh, like my editor, people ask me if I had a short story collection in mind. So as soon as I heard from people, from like my editor and the people at FSG that they were interested in short stories. So I'm like, OK, I can I can do this. I can I can pursue my short story collection. And it's fun. If you're writing a novel, it's fun to break, come out of the novel, which I was also writing a novel at the time, a lot of these stories. So, you know, it gives me an excuse to get out of the novel and to pursue a different emotion. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. When you're writing a novel, you're stuck in one emotion. You're stuck in this one place. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so like to, so when you saw so to have a, like a short story to get you out of it, that is a completely different like emotion than your novel is. It's like, oh my God, I, this, I really needed to do this. Yeah. Especially since you write a short story and you're like, you're done in a week and you're not going to finish that novel for like another year or whatever. Right. Yeah. All my time spans are like 10 times yours, but I appreciate this idea that you <laughs> can do this quickly. <laughs> why don't you, uh, why don't you read us a little something? Speaking of yeah, breaking yeah, things yeah, up, let's, uh, let's stop and have you read a little. Definitely. Definitely. I'm going to read uh, a short story, obviously from the collection called El Ritmo de la Noche. And this was a story, it was, it was, it was commissioned to me by, uh, I'll tell you a little bit afterwards more about it, but anyway, it's called El Ritmo de la Noche. El Ritmo de la Noche was not so much a rhythm, although that's still debated, but a salsa. Its initial distribution traced back to two high school dropouts from the valley. One of them, Octavio H., was sleeping through his sophomore English two class, and he audibly gasped when the teacher got banged on his desk to awaken him. When Octavio's eyes dilated to his peers laughing at his expense, he got up and said, this class is nothing. I don't need to be here because you know what? I make the money. I go fishing at the canal and then sell the fish at the store. I don't need any of this. He walked out of the door as the teacher watched with her arms crossed. There had previously, there had previously been problems with Octavio since in those days the campus was open and she let him go as he pleased. Octavio wandered out of the school, past the graveyard, through the wheat field, until he ended up in front of a junked out Rose Royce with many chila trees growing through and around it. Hunched over the driver's seat, picking chiles from a branch going through the rear window and dropping them into a pail was Octavio's friend and business partner, Alex Z. Octavio leaned on the open door and whistled shrilly. Alex jumped back, startled, and honked the horn with his ass. They both laughed, shut the door to the Rolls Royce, and made their way toward the trailer of the woman they called the astronaut due to the old space helmet she kept among potted plants on her mosquito netted front porch. Upon the boy's arrival, the astronaut was already waiting with a large styrofoam ice chest. She took the pail of chiles from Alex, pointed at the chest, and the two boys opened it. Many jars were stacked inside, and steam rose from the bottom because their contents were hot. On every jar was a white label with the words El Ritmo de la Noche, between two shoddily sharpied musical notes that resembled hockey sticks. Alex and Octavio loaded the styrofoam ice chest onto a rusty wheelbarrow and took turns pushing it until shortly before dusk when they arrived at the club 
Pasito Tuntun. The manager there, Roel, was expecting the boys and two, and two young men only a few years older than Octavio and Alex took the chest from the wheelbarrow and carried it out back. Roel, with grave concern, asked the boys about the astronaut, how her health seemed. She looked, the boys looked at each other and agreed that she appeared fine. Roel nodded, gave them each a sealed envelope and a free shot of the strong stuff, then excused himself. He had a club to run, he said. Octavio and Alex opened their envelopes about 50 feet from the club and counted the money. I'd made more sticky to my fish, Octavio said, and it's less work. They agreed to team up again either way, and before parting, set a time to meet the following morning at the junked out Rolls Royce. Back at the club in the manager's office, Roel smoked a cigarette as he stared into the open ice chest. He picked up a jar and with his right thumb traced the hockey stick musical notes. El ritmo de la noche, he said to himself. Saying the words aloud brought a mysterious breeze into the closed room as if he would read them from a sacred book. He put out his cigarette and sealed the chest then instructed the two young men on his payroll to wrap the chest carefully in trash bags and carry it onto his truck, which was loaded with other similar packages. Roel didn't trust anybody to make the shipment, so he took a shot of the same stuff he'd given the boys, then took the tr truck north himself. He made it past customs without a problem, and in the town of Fowl, met up with his man, and in an uninhabited mob shack, in an, in an uninhabited mob shack. His man inspected El Rimo de la Noche, really taking his time with it. Finally, as if coming to this conclusion reluctantly, his man said he could probably extract a good dance number out of it, even the hit single. So it was agreed, and there in that mob shack, they opened every jar of El Rimo de la Noche and boiled the contents down, trapped the vapors and stored them in vials. Roel then paid his man and moved the vials not only down south and farther north, but to every major city in the tri-state area. Soon, El Rimo de la Noche was the big hit of the summer, then of the year. It was played on every hip station and spun in every club. People danced to El Rimo de la Noche in the streets. Nobody could believe this hit. And when the royalties came in, neither could Roel, who had to admit he scored big. Years went by, then decades, and Roel felt he'd put old properties, marriages, and politicians behind him. After everything, he was grateful that investments like El Rimo de la Noche were still paying off. One evening, he was reflecting on his early nightclub days as he stared at an empty jar he hadn't seen in a long time. It had a white label with hockey stick musical notes and had recently been sent to him with a little message inside requesting a meeting. Moments later, Roel's head butler appeared in the office studio and announced, sir, your guest has arrived. Roel got up from his puffy leather chair and greeted the stout balding man entering his office. So it is you, Octavio. We meet again. The following afternoon, after finding it odd that Roel hadn't come down all morning, the head butler found him dead, slumped over his leather chair in the office studio. When questioned by medics and the police, the head butler told them the last time he'd seen Roel alive was when he'd brought the balding man into his office. The head butler couldn't recall the balding man's name and hadn't caught him leaving, but mentioned the peculiar jar labeled El Rimo de la Noche they'd received anonymously only days prior. There didn't appear to be foul play, and it was later determined 
Roel had suffered a heart attack. When the head butler and the police officers looked for the jar labeled El Ritmo de la Noche in the office studio, it was nowhere to be found. That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it's so hard to exit from the reading part in these virtual readings. Virtual I know, readings. right? Like, ah, you're mm -hmm. only audience member and very excited about what you just did. That's um, a yeah, <laughs> usually there's like somebody like you make eye contact with and yeah. you're like, right, I'm done. Well, the best part about going back to live events has definitely been that one person who's just looks pumped at every event they go to and you're just always like looking for them. But I am your pumped person today, as I'm <laughs> sure other people in the audience are. So thanks so much for that. Thank um, you. Thank you, man. Yeah, I think I you're going to tell a story about the conception of it. But my question, I think, will maybe lead there. So I will. I will. Totally. To yeah, please it. go ahead. Um, so, uh, Albertmo de la Noche feels like a bit of a companion piece to, to Queso, the story that opens the collection. They, they oh, both oh. are sort of about uh, elements of Mexican culture, Mexican know-how, or sort of uh, or work that are brought north and then co-opted or, or stolen or assimilated for American profit. Um, in Queso, we see the plan for the exploitation, but not the like actual outcome, although it's really easy to imagine because they're laying out the plan. And then Albertmo, we see the way that Royale exploits it and, and the way that Octavio seemingly gets revenge and takes it back at the end, right? Um, I'm just curious if you conceived these stories together, was one a response to the other, or did you just sort of realize that you'd written these two pieces that were sort of moving in a similar way? Yeah, definitely that last one, that last yeah. one. You know, this piece actually was uh, like uh, one of the editors, Andrew Durbin, who uh, was the, is the editor at Freeze Magazine, mm. uh, uh, contacted me like three years ago asking me if I had a piece and they had a theme you know I don't know how you are with like theme I'm really bad at like themes when somebody asks the me works. terrible yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my theme is this and I'm right. like oh okay and <laughs> I'm always, know, I've never had a thought about that ever in my life <laughs> yeah so, so I'm like so their theme was food you know so I'm like oh what do I do they had a 1200 word 1200 word limit so I'm like you know I've never written a murder mystery or like a mystery kind of thing. And it seemed exciting to me to try to write a 1200 word murder mystery to me. Like, I'm like, all right, okay. And I'm like, okay, I have the conventions of the murder mysteries. I had Butler there, you know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, there's a lot of characters in murder mysteries. How many characters can I fit into a 1200 mm. word story? You know what I mean? Like how many, how can I keep the story moving? It was a great exercise as far as plot, to be honest, like, yeah to try to have a 1200 word story that is that just moves on and has as many characters as possible and that in the end it's centered around murder an unsolved murder <laughs> murder you know so it was fun to me i did it really really fast like i said earlier that these stories were written and so that was really really fun to me and it wasn't until like people have been pointing out recently about the similarities in the stories and and I see that, and I see that, and the word, you know, in the story, the, the case of story was written in a very different way, you know, I was unemployed, and I had to, you know, I was going through a lot of, uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, uh, interviews, job interviews, mm -hmm. and I hated them, I, 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 I thought that they should just give me the job, I was right. like, give me the job, <laughs> I was like offended, like, the, the first two jobs I got, I had in Austin, you know, and I kept these jobs for like four or five years each, you know, I wrote my information on trash bag, in right. both those jobs. I walked in, they gave me a bag, I wrote my information, they called me. Right. So to have me, like, write a resume and stuff, I found this so insulting. And to have him, like, <laughs> review me, I'm like, just give me the job. Come on. I'm right. going to be making coffee or whatever. Please right. just give me the job. So I was just, I just came home, I was pissed, and I just wrote the story. To me, it just, everything was just gibberish. I'm like, I'm just going to write the most gibberish story ever. And this, I guess now that I'm saying it out loud, you know, is it was similar. I was trying to write a story with that was mostly the dialogue was mostly gibberish, but mm -hmm. then move the plot forward somehow, move a, a story forward somehow. And uh, and I was happy with it. in the end. I felt that it ma made some kind of statement in the end. You know, I feel like in many ways, I feel that I, I didn't write these stories, but I feel that I did my best with each one with my role in there. Mm -hmm. I don't know, as a writer and seeing these stories, especially when you see the final book, 
I always feel like the least important aspect of the whole. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you, I don't know how you feel about it. Like, I think like, you know, I'm like, okay, now I can exist out there in the world. Uh Like whatever. I'm the least exponent, you know, I, I don't know anything about this in many ways, you know, (laughs) you know, and they always get, that only goes up like the longer the book exists. Right. You know, I mean, I, um, I interviewed Jonathan Lethem like five or six years ago and he was like, the best thing in the world is when your books are like 20 years old and people come up and be like, Oh, I loved your first novel. And you're like, I wonder what it's about. You know, like you're sort of like, <laughs> and I feel like that happens so fast. Like it doesn't, you don't need 20 years. Like it's yeah, just like, yeah. the huge things in my books are total mysteries to me at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah that's funny. You know, you know, something that is interesting also that, that I guess this book, like this is my third book now. And you have a, you have, you have a few books. You have more than three books out now, too. So people can say, "Oh, this is my favorite book of yours." Right. You know, as opposed to like when you have like one book out, like everybody's kind of like forced to like it. Yeah, yeah, it's so thumbs up or thumbs down on you it. entirely, yeah. right? It's just like a referendum on you as a person. Yeah, yeah it's good so to have a bunch. You can kind of like scapegoat around and be like, "Oh, I like this. This this one is my favorite one of your books." Yeah. Like without telling. So now, like, so that's what's interesting about having like now like a few books out and. <laughs> To have people like say that, and I'm like, oh, okay, I can see that. I guess you know, I can see, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. It happened to me yesterday for the first time. Like somebody said that to me, and I was like, oh, that's that's weird. Uh, yeah, people could have now a favorite book of yours, and you're like, all right. It's, it's almost like a weird, like you were a really sweet kid when you're like a grown up. It's like, I don't like this version of you that much, but like you were, you were great back then, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, I'm not even sure what word you necessarily would use, but all the things that your work's described as is like fantastical or surreal or absurd or whatever word you would use in these slippier moments where the story veers away from the expected real. Um, in an earlier interview when Truffle Pig came out, you said something about Texas that I've always seen that comes across in its underground music and visual art, but not so much in its literature, is how surreal this place is, how psychedelic. I've always wonder, I'm always wondering about the stories here, about the lost stories. What type of stories existed in this land before 1492? I bet the oldest stories of this land were fantastical in essence. And I really love that. I wonder if you could just talk about how you... Um, I mean, my guess is you're not designing those moments in advance because that doesn't seem to have anything to do with your process. But I'm curious, like as you enter a moment that is uh, where reality is maybe f- becoming fantastical in some way, like how you inhabit that as a writer. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, these things are really important to me. Like I think about like writers, you know, when we think of, like I saw the, recently like a literary like map of the United States. Right. You know? And, you know, you see, like, Texas, and you see, like, and it's, like, you see Larry McMurtry, you know, you see, yeah. like, Cormac McCarthy, like, right. over here, like, in the West, and I'm, like, you know, all of our, like, the Texas landscape and literature is, you know, even though it's so diverse, like, Robert E. Howard, who came, who wrote all these Conan the Barbarian right. stories, he's from, you know, Cold the Conqueror, and yeah. all these stories that he wrote, he's, and he's from Texas, you know, he never, I don't think he... He lived most of his life in Texas as he died when he was 33 years old. I was so young, yeah. Yeah, and he, uh, you know, and the terrain that exists in the stories is a very Texas terrain, you know. And it, so to me, it was it's very interesting that these stories existed in this land. And we don't ever really think about Robert E. Howard as a Texas writer, mm-hmm. you know. Like, we never really think about Patricia Highsmith either as a... No, not at all. Yeah, it never would occur to me. She's from Fort Worth. She's from Fort Worth, you know. If you look at some of her novels and even like her Ripley character, you know, there's very, very Texas things in there, you know. And so I'm very, very conscious of these kinds of things and how literature, how Texas is perceived in literature. And I really, I I wonder like what my role is in the whole thing as a writer. So I really try to do something that is exciting that I, I've never seen before, you know, it's exciting to me as, you know, a creator, because like, you know, why not try to do something that nobody's done? Why not try to describe the indescribable, you know, things like this, you know, 
so I'm really, really conscious of, of these things and how I access it. Like in the Rimo La Noche story, I was like, how can, how can I make this story exciting? You know, even if nothing really fantastical happens in the story, like the language in it, I kind of play around with the language in it. And that is what's fantastical mm. to me in there, you know, to take this term, Rimo La Noche, whatever, the rhythm of the night, take this idea of salsa and create this weird idea really mm-hmm. this weird idea that it's hard to maybe pierce through or picture like as a reader but i think there's something in there with that the reader kind of fills in that that i like to leave in there you know i like to leave little mm-hmm. gaps in there you know so i think that is my my role to try to to get there as far as possible without fully giving the full, disclosing the full idea to the reader. Like the truffle pig, I describe only so much of the truffle pig in a very minimalist way. You know, like I visited a class recently where they all read truffle pig and every one of the students drew the truffle pig. Love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all had a different idea what the truffle right. pig looked like, like. I have a pretty strong visual impression of the truffle pig, right? I sort of great. like, it's like, oh, yeah. you really? Yeah, I guess maybe you don't describe it that much, but I definitely like That's have it in great. my mind. See, I did that on purpose so that, you know. Oh, absolutely, yeah. For that reason, you know, I always thought about how Kafka didn't want like the insect or the bug. Right. On the cover of the book, you know, he never wanted it depicted. I always, that kind of always stuck with my mind you know uh we always think that you know kafka's work wasn't published during his lifetime but actually the metamorphosis and other stories were published right. in his lifetime you know so so these things i don't know i tried to have like a dialogue with like literary history and with like texas like and to try to, and to try to tell stories like texas stories that aren't that really haven't been pierced through like i think about like these stories like the golem and the check mm-hmm. in the Prague neighborhood you know yeah this creature that is like a frankenstein kind of creature that exists you know how that represents something like that and i think about like creatures like the chupacabra right you know like this creature that exists like in texas that is like a mythical kind of creature kind of a joke now you know but a great name chupacabra yeah. you know it's a great name that hasn't been successfully i think uh adapted into either <laughs> in uh horror and any right kind of horror, right right how yeah, has there that must happened? be like a movie that's called like chupacabra seven like the the yeah, happening like, or something but yeah you why know, <laughs> had there's like lip it's like a leprechaun movie right absolutely yeah, yeah yeah so like uh, it's amazing to me how that really hasn't you know hadn't hit the mainstream yet the chupacabra so you know, I think about these things and I try to play with them, you know, and I, you know, like Texas lore that really hasn't hit the mainstream and play with them, you know, play yeah. with them. And to like the punk, like all the punk stuff, you know, like it's play right. yeah. and try to put it into, interpret it in a literary kind of uh, form, you know. Yeah. I, uh, I, we're hitting toward time. So I want to invite people in the audience. Like this is a good time to put things in the Q and A. John will come back and talk about those a couple minutes. I'm going to ask Fernando another last question just to give you time to write. Um, one of my, and we will talk about a different story just so people can hear some of the other things in it. One of my favorite stories is the one that ends it, the, the Oswald variations. And with a young Lee Harvey Oswald, there's a brief career as the front man of the band Sarcophagus. Um, it's presented as this branching choose your own adventure kind of kind of thing. It's a lot of fun. It's a really fun way to, to read the book. I actually felt like a really reader friendly way to end a book where you're like, oh, there's 20 pages left. And you're like, yeah, but you don't have to read them all. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've always wanted to have a book that can end in a different spot. Yeah, it felt really great. And yeah. I was just, you know, always wanted to write something like that. I loved kind of choose your adventure stuff growing up. I'm just curious if you talk about like how you wrote it, like sort of like, did you, how yeah. did you, uh, did you map it? Like, how do you make a story like this? This feels like it defies your, I wrote this in three pages on a typewriter. Yeah, no, yeah. This is the most complex story because the city of Austin actually had this thing called Wander, Austin, Texas, where they have a map of the city that, and they have like, it was like a touristy thing where people can go to different locations mm. and the story kind of happened. So the story, so the city of Austin commissioned a few writers and I didn't know about it, but, the, but the, one of the persons, one of the people, uh, his name is Chris Gannon, who started it, contacted me because he knew I was a writer. He saw an article about my work. He said, hey, we're doing this. 
do you have anything that could fit for this? And I had kind of like this Lee Harvey Oswald story and I, I needed the money and it paid well. This is before, this is like 2015, 2016. So I'm like, yes, I'll do it. Give me, right. I'll, <laughs> I'll do whatever you want. Okay. So mm. the city engineers gave me a map, gave me a map of the city that would, would pretty much be the structure of my story, you know? So I was like, so I, so I couldn't write the story, even though I had this Lee Harvey Oswald idea, I couldn't write it until I saw what it was going to look like, you know? Right. So they sent it to me and then I just had to figure it out. They sent, and I had a visual map of the story and I, 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 it was the first time I did anything like this. And it's actually the most research I've ever done for anything I've ever written. I, right. I, everything kind of matched up to when Lee Harvey Oswald like was in Dallas, all these historical things matched up. You know, I did a lot of research on his mother. You know, I read a whole book about his mother that is super fascinating. Mm -hmm. His mother was a super interesting person. And also like, you know, when I was a teenager, I watched JFK. Sure, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Movie. <laughs> and even though that movie, like after watching it, it's like you like sniffed a whole like yeah, yeah a whole kilo of cocaine or whatever the hell because conspiracy theories of QAnon conspiracy theories or whatever. Right. But it still has like this Rashomon aspect of it that I mm -hmm. like. You know? So it must have and I didn't realize this until like a year ago that oh I must have this must have influenced that story. But but yeah, so to me, like when the when the city engineer sent me the story, I just put that story together and try to figure out when it was going to begin and end. It was very, very fun for me as a writer for that to happen, you know, to play with structure. So, so this, so it kind of fits with the whole theme of the book with mm -hmm. a lot of these stories, like El Rimo de la Noche, like 1200 uh, word murder mystery. They all have kind of like constraints that I, stylistic constraints that I gave myself right. while writing, you know, and this is the, and that story, the last one is the most, extreme example of that because you know and i i thank the city engineers i don't even know how to how to credit people like did they right. write the story i don't know they just gave me the map i still have the map of the city you know so oh, that's great i love it thank you thank yeah. you so much so uh you know it was a it was a great experience i highly recommend you know writers to you know i i, I highly recommend it as an exercise for any writer mm -hmm. really you know yeah. Also, that something that I discovered that is important is that the term "choose your own adventure." Uh, you can get sued in a New York minute for saying for even saying that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, we're not doing that. Which is, you know, crazy. I mean, the Lipo writers invented the choose your own adventure story, but the, the guys yeah, in yeah, yeah. Where somebody has the has the trademark yeah. from there. All but over. I wish there was a that that kind of story had a, had a, had a name because you can't. How am I going to say that? It's hard for me to say that I. Yeah, wrote I say a, a branching narrative. You yeah, know. I wrote like a weird branching narrative. Yes, I don't know. Yes, it used yes. to be like a, like, a, <laughs> like a French word that describes right, it, right. You know? Yes. Uh, I know John's going to come back in a second, so I'll, I'll let him him uh, come in and, and finish things up or maybe ask his own questions. But this is such a blast, always. It's always so fun to, so to chat with you and get yeah, to, for your, get to your kick around writing for a little questions. bit. So I, I love Valley asking again. We'll show it again just so people in the audience or watch it later on YouTube. It's so great. It's such a beautiful book. Um, I'm really excited about it. So thank you so much for it. Can't wait for the new novel. Thank you so much. I can't wait for the novel. <laughs> you, too, yeah, you too, right? <laughs> Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi. Thank you both. Um, we don't have any questions in the Q&A just yet. Um, I'm happy to give viewers more time to ask, but uh, Matt, I don't want you to have to disappear uh, <laughs> away from, from us just yet. So if there are additional questions you wanted to ask Fernando or um, topics you wanted to get into, uh, I, I would like to encourage that because sure, yeah. I'm enjoying I listening to it. The, the things I was thinking about a little bit too, and, and we've hit on maybe though, is, is music. You know, you're a musician as well, I believe, right? And sort of the role of music in your work. Um, in your acknowledgments, you uh, you thank Courtney Barnett and Nat King Cole for these sort of specific musical inspirations on the stories you got it, take it away, and pheasants. I mean, you also thank a couple of music labels, uh, Unseen Worlds, Mississippi Records, Light in the Attics, for the necessary jams, which I really love. Um, and uh, music is, you know, really important to me in my life and, and in my writing practice. And I was just curious 
what happens to your writing uh, when you're listening to a piece of music over and over. You mentioned for You Got It, Take It Away, that you listened to Courtney Barnett's Shivers like the entire time you were writing yeah. that story. Yeah. And, and what's it do to your sort of, what does it change to have that sort of constant repetitive backdrop? Yeah, you know, I think it's just, I think it's a matter of tricking yourself into writing. Mm -hmm. I think every time you start writing, and I use you like the royal you, I think you have to trick yourself into writing, at least like me. Yeah. Like, so if, you know, the way I have a, like I have like a little table in my room, and I have a space where I can just walk in a circle over mm -hmm. and over until I go crazy or whatever. So uh, I just play that, I would just play that song. I don't know, and it just happens, it just happens naturally. That song would just, just so something about that song. I don't know, it just took me to this story, you know? And I always wanted to write a weird story about alien spacecraft remnants. And like, whenever we read like a science fiction story, like a Philip K. Dick or something, they usually, the protagonist is usually like an Elon Musk kind of character. They usually deal with like a big businessman. So I really wanted to write like a kind of sci-fi-ish kind of story that took place like just like in the duplex in right. the east side of Austin, you know, and this guy who just happens to have something that may or may not be from an alien spacecraft, you know, and just the dynamics around that. And, you know, so there's something about this that really really about that song that really really took me there and it's also it's, again it's a matter of like tricking myself into writing there's something about that song that just took me into that story but like uh but like you know how uh, i read about how you know how how when you go fishing with fishermen or what they never hit the same spot the, the same the fish are never in the same spot right. twice you know so the, I can never use the same song for for other other. Oh yeah, right? definitely, you know, absolutely, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so if one song takes you there, I I you know I take it as far as humanly possible, and I and I I just listen to it over and over until I, I get there, and I I just finish the story, you know. And luckily, it just happened that those stories too, you know, the Nat King Cole. Mm -hmm. He recorded uh, two records in Spanish, and I think it's hilarious. <laughs> right, because I don't think he, he, I don't think he, he like even spoke Spanish. Even right. Spanish so he's just memorizing the the lyrics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, like when I play it, like sometimes, like my non Spanish speaking friends are like, "Wow, this is like is uh, if I would to write, to record a Spanish record, this right. is what it was not like." <laughs> But to me, it's but to me, it's, it's beautiful in a way. It says a lot about influence, and some of these songs he he sings them really beautifully. And in the movie, there's a movie called the the One Car Wine Movie and the Mood for Love, mm. uh, which takes place in Hong Kong in like the '60s. And the soundtrack, the recurring soundtrack, is Nat King Cole in mm. Spanish. And to me, oh, that wow. was really, yeah. that's really really beautiful and interesting, you know. And I learned that at the time, Nat King, that record and just Cuban music in general was really, really big in Hong Kong. And it was really, really beautiful. Just the juxtaposition of these images in that movie really, really influenced me, you know, in many ways. Uh, so in that particular uh, uh, Nat King Cole song that influenced me is called El Bodeguero, which means the warehouse man, you know, and I really like this the term bodega you know I, in new york Ooh, yeah bodega is one of the great words right bodega, like, yeah, it's absolutely. a great word but in the board on the border it just means a warehouse like a right. big boring ass warehouse with pallets of mm -hmm. products or like medical equipment or whatever so i really like this malleable kind of term bodega that means different terms to me it's when i was a teenager you know i got a job on, on working at a warehouse you know Right. And it was a terrible job. I hated it so much for two years, you know, right on the border, right on the border, you know, in the hot ass warehouse in the summer. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. So uh, I think about these things El Bodeguero and me and I, this other idea of a bodega, you know. So so this culture of influence was really something that was in my mind. That's something that I like about these labels in particular that. I like these weird records that these labels resurface. Like, mm -hmm. oh, it's this guy 
you know, who lived in this one place, recorded these five, six songs in 1970, and nobody ever found them until, like, Katrina or whatever. Or like, I, that that's actually happened. Like, somebody, like, I, I don't even know the name of the record. This, this musician from New Orleans recorded a record in the 70s that nobody ever put out. Mm. And during Katrina, it was like lost forever. And somebody found it in a garage sale in California. And it was unlabeled. And it took right. that person a long time to find out what it was. So yeah. things like that, the mythology of all that is like mind boggling to me. And so I take these things. I love liner notes, you know, liner mm-hmm. notes. Absolutely, yeah. I love yeah. the storytelling in liner notes, you know. Yeah. I tried to replicate it in my first book, uh, uh, that's to the bullshit artists of South Texas. The way those stories are told are very much in the style of like liner notes and mm-hmm. stuff like that. You know, I love that kind of media. I think you know, like, like wine labels too. Like, like the description of a wine label. Like that's like to me. Like I want to like the peak as a writer. Like I want to write like how a wine, <laughs> like a wine label. You know, it's all. I mean, both those things are kinds of like self mythologies, right? You know, they're like liner notes or like this like added piece of information yeah, thing attached yeah. to it. Like, yeah. I mean, and I like the creativity. Yeah. yeah, the creativity behind some wine labels. That's sometimes they have a little short story there or something. Mm-hmm. You know. So you remember that thing where Chipotle was hiring famous writers to write? I Chipotle remember books? that. Maybe you can I be on like that. a, yeah, we'll, yeah. Get a, we'll get you a Chipotle cup. It'll be good. Yeah. So I like storytelling in like media and things like mm-hmm. that and try to like incorporate it into like, into my own work. Yeah. You know? And however I can, you know, I love storytelling in like little bits, like even like in a bottle. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like, I mean, it feels very much like being a kid who's a reader. Like you just read everything, like right. Like if there was text in view, I was reading it. Like signs, cereal boxes, shampoo bottles. Like you know, you have that like voraciousness of like everything is a text. Like as opposed to like these are the things you read and not everything yeah. else. Yeah, and also everything has a style. You know, how can you mm-hmm. come across? You know, and to to try to duplicate that. You know, I don't know. I try to I try to do that sometimes. Try to duplicate these little moments in mm-hmm. media and try to put them into, into my stories. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it comes across, uh, you know, yeah. to the reader. That's good. I think those are the places that we get that like recognition, right? We sort of like we're, we're, all the like flotsam of like culture or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, I think we're reaching the top of the hour. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and if I might, um, a question I have not returned to for both of you uh, and a bit on this series, uh, if you'll humor me, we uh, like to, uh, obviously we have our staff picks uh, in the bookstore uh, of what our, what our booksellers are currently reading, but I, for two uh incredibly idiosyncratic and wonderful <laughs> writers like Fernando and Flores and Matt Bell. I'm curious to know uh, if you'd like to share with us uh, what you might recommend to our viewers from your current uh, uh, reading habits. Uh, Matt, I notice some face outs behind you, including I think a, a title that will uh, of an author who will have on our virtual event series in a few weeks, Eugene Martin's oh, great. The Life. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to know if you, just one or two things that you may be reading. And also if you want to broaden it out to into other media that I find that fine too. So if there's like a podcast or a mini series or something that you're also enjoying, please feel free to share. Yeah, I can go first. So Fernando can have the last word at his event. I think that's the, I always should end with the, the guest of honor. Um, I, you know, I've been sort of uh, uh, pushing for the last couple of months, this book by uh, a Chinese writer, Yan Gi, she wrote a book called The Strange Beasts of China. It's a really bizarre kind of science fiction novel. I really, really liked, I think uh, really resisted like easy readings in the best way. It was uh, translated by a, a Singaporean writer, Jeremy Tang. Um, I highly suggest that. So Strange Beasts of China by Yan Gi. Um, I think is one of the like most interesting books I've sort of read in the last you know couple months. That sounds amazing. Yeah, you would like it, I think, Fernando. I, I gotta, I gotta get check that. It out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never even heard of it. Wow, yeah. I gotta get a copy of that. Uh, you know, I've been talking about this book for a while, and just because I've been slowly reading it because I love it, it's uh, I'm always reading one of those New York Video Books Classics books. And I almost never read westerns, but I'm almost done with Warlock by Oakley Hall. Have mm. you have you all read? Have you all read that? God, it's so good. You know, that's one of the only 
books that in the back there's like instead of like the copy of what the book is like it's just a huge Thomas Pynchon quote about the book (laughs) like uh, it takes up the whole back of the book nice so it's super interesting because it's written in the third person and there's segment segments in there that are the journals of this one peripheral character in the narrative and he's kind of like a superfluous character in the third person narrative in this Western that, that is like a tombstone Arizona kind of narrative. Mm. Uh, so as far as the way it's told, it's fascinating because it's, you see the third person narrative unfold and you see the perspective of this shop owner who is a peripheral character, like I said, in the narrative almost unimportant you see your perspective throughout you see his flawed perspective you see his opinions change about people Mm. and the way i never seen anything written quite in this way like stylistically and for this it's and for other reasons for like there's so many characters it's one of those books that like it takes like 70 80 pages in for everything to finally click in because there's so many characters you know and there's so many conflicts, but once it does, you're like, you're in there. You're like, wow, it's like, it's, it's the best. I don't read a lot of Westerns, but it's the best of that genre that I've, I've ever read. And not only that, like, it's just craft wise, the way it's told, there's nothing like it. I've mm-hmm. already, I'll check I've it out. That sounds great. Game. So yeah. that's, I experienced Warlock. I mean, I, I, that's what I recommend. Warlock by Oakley Hall. You had me at a uh, uh, gigantic pinch and pull. <laughs> you gotta <laughs> like, you gotta like pick it up and look at it because it's like breath. Of, yeah, I've never seen anybody do that with a book, not with any of the NYRB classics books. Yeah, that's great. Well, you're both uh, expert hand sellers because I'm about to get both these books, so uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, we reached the top of the hour, Fernando e. Flores, Matt Bell. Thank you so much for joining us at oh, Home so of Literati. So um fernando congrats on valley-esque um hope to have you both uh, in the store in the not too distant future uh we'll have to do this again in person but until then um thanks for joining us to all of our viewers thank you for joining us we'll see you at the next event take care thank all. have a great much, night Matt. thank you john have a lovely evening everybody thank take you care.